Well, and, you know. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kim Kitchener's Artist Talk. Before we get started, I would like to do a quick land acknowledgement. AANM is located on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, Dene's people, and the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. We note that Treaty 3 is where Winnipeg receives its water supply, and most of our electricity is taken from Treaty 5. We aim to move forward in solidarity with Indigenous people to address the continued harm perpetuated by colonialism. Disability justice must take into account experiences of ableism that intersect with racism, sexism, ageism, sizeism, queer and transphobia, set of colonialism, and white supremacy. We try to learn from systems of oppression and movements of resistance and how they implicate us. We believe all people have a right to participate in, inform, and lead arts and culture. So today we are gonna be speaking with Kim Kitchener. So Kim Kitchener is a multidisciplinary artist working in audio and film as a result of a deliberating and transformative illness. She explores collective cultural understandings of the female body, its intersections with and presence within the natural world. This is also evident through the inclusion of ritual in her work, drawing on her lifelong connection to the primordial mother and to knowledge of her ancestral homelands of old Europe. This ongoing research and consciousness has deeply influenced her artistic practice, which lately has been largely tactile, focusing on painting, sculpture, installations, and performance. Currently, Kim engages her practice of critical inquiry of body slash land relations and the self-reflexive relationship between ability and artistic production through largely multimedia approaches. With significant changes in mobility, old spaces become unknown insofar as the body must learn anew how to navigate through them. The familiar becomes unfamiliar. The body is tasked with relearning how to exist, reaching out in changed, renewed, and ever urgent ways through creativity. Kim's community activism and inclu is inclusive, celebratory, and exuberant. In contrast, her work is introspective, thoughtful, promotes quiet reflection. Now more than ever, interdependence is fundamental for this disabled artist. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kim, and we can't wait to hear you talk about your artwork. Well, thank you for having me. I really want to thank your organization. It's just, uh, it's, it's just been a wonderful opportunity. And I'll also thank the uh, Canada Council of the Arts for the grant they provided in this research residency I did. So the title is Her Voice, The Waves Like Silk. Would you like me just to begin talking about it? Okay. So I, I, rheumatoid arthritis came to me eight years ago and, and I was bedridden for three years. Like it, it came severe. Um, my husband and I lived in the bush. We had a homestead, you know, uh, it was just this really shocking time. I, you know, you, you kind of can't believe it's happening, right, when it goes on for so long. But it took that long for me to find a treatment um, that, you know, got my, my mobility and, and, of course, lessened the pain that I had in my body every day. And so after I started getting stronger, I... Um, I was missing the land. We had moved into town by that time for accessibility and so that I had support. Um, you know, you got to be strong to live in the bush, right? And, and that was no longer. So here in town, I decided to apply for a grant that would rent an RV, return to the shore of Lake Superior, which has always been a very special place for our family. And, and just really like 
experience. Could I, could I travel like that? Um, could I exist in a, in a provincial park? Was it accessible enough? And would I be able to capture work? And I was really focused on audio at the time. I'd already, I'd always been, you know, photographer, just to inform the content of my work, really. Um, and so my husband and I, my husband was my driver and my support person, and off we went for 10 days. And, you know, it was just profound. It was profound to be out on the land again and to find a way um, that I could that I could function. It was so exciting. And so with this Canada Council Research Grant, you know, nothing was, I didn't have to, I didn't have to provide any work done in the end. However, this work of, you know, the journal, the film, I just kind of kept tapping into that over the next three years because, because it was so profound. I mean, you know, when you're that ill and then, you know, you rise up again. And yes, I, I continually deal with all kinds of symptoms every day. But the fact that I found a way, you know, to be out on the land again was just, wow, well, it's just incredible. So I really wanted to make this work, you know, like it wasn't required or anything, but I, I just felt so grateful that I wanted to put it into film, audio, some of the photography and then the journal. And, and the whole idea of my death silk, you know, that I've had for over 20 years laying in the cedar chest, my family all knowing about that and the rituals that we learned when we were hanging out with the Iranians back, you know, when we were younger. And I just thought it was such a beautiful ritual <clears throat> and so full of intention, you know? And so I bought that, that silk. And, and the night before we went to Superior, um, I, it not really like a dream. I always have these kind of videos that run through that I see very clearly. And, and I woke up to seeing the video that I needed to take the silk. I didn't know why, I didn't know why, but I always trust you know that. And so I, I packed the silk and then when we got there and um, you know, was just having a wonderful time on the shoreline of Lake Superior, you know, just the, I mean, she's just so powerful. The silk, I brought it out and I started, uh, you know, getting, getting myself and the silk uh, images taken. And, and when I got home and I started looking at all that I captured, I realized the silk had been bought and it was in a fabric land store and a clearance bin and and I needed to take that silk you know to bathe it in the water for it to be on the land for it to be with my body so just creating memory right so the silk has been traveling around greatly now <laughs> but you know those rituals for me are really about bringing things into the, into the physical world, you know, our spiritual intention, our spiritual thoughts, and then bringing that into the physical space. And, you know, let's face it, we're a, so, a, a social socialization of culture that, you know, really does everything to disregard death, to not, you know, no discussions. And I found it amazing when I had my first baby that this lovely, dear, dear friend and elder had visited me. And, and as I was changing Nicole's diaper that day, that's when she said that to me. She said, you know, when we give birth, we give death. You know, such a powerful message, right? And, you know, maybe some would find that shocking or, you know, negative, but it really, it really empowered me. Yeah. So off we went to Superior and had this beautiful experience and came home and for the next four months, we looked to find a used RV. 
So, so we bought one in November and way up north. And she's 29 years old now. Some farmer had it in their drive shed, you know, and only had 50,000 kilometers on it. Um, and so we've been enjoying that since. And we have a daughter and her wife who live out in PEI. So, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's really the only way I can travel any distance. I can't, I can't sit in a car for any more than an hour, you know? Or I just can't walk for hours after and yeah so the work I hope inspires you know those who experience similar you know that there's always ways any questions so far well what I thought was so interesting about the work is the juxtaposition of you with your disability but you're alive you're there, you're in, in nature as you were born nude with the silk. So there's just this, this idea that, that I, that I really related to as a person with a disability that, that in a way, because of our disability, we have death that we walk side by side with death um, every day, right? Cause we never know what's going to change with our disabilities. And so that juxtaposition of the, I'm here, I'm taking up space, but I'm also acknowledging that I'm not here forever with that death shroud mm -hmm. was really an interesting um, just juxtaposition. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit more about the life and death and, and how that kind of relates to the disability experience. Well, when I looked at that picture, that image of me lying um, naked, you know, it took two people to get me into that position. Those stones, of course, were very uncomfortable. Um, but that's but but just like you say, it's it's so prevalent when you see it, you know, thinking about all that. Right. Especially for those of us who have chronic pain, and disability, you know, it, it's just this it's 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 all of it. It's the extremes. Right. And as far as my body and being naked, I have been naked my whole life. I don't know. My parents haven't been. But luckily, they never stopped me. You know, I grew up on a lake in northern Ontario and Raven Lake is our cottage. And fortunately, there was this family, this German family that lived in the same bay as us. And oh, my gosh, I would see them. It just became a, you know, a normal thing to see grandma and grandpa and mom and dad and all the children naked out on the stone swimming, like just so normalized. Right. And that was me. Um, but I didn't like I didn't ever really see anybody do that. So, so it just really reaffirmed. But what I feel like my nakedness in nature, it has freed me from the prescribed uh, dictated demands of, you know, our bodies and what, what we should look like, because I've always compared my body to what's around me in nature. Right. And so the rounds and the curves and the and and, you know, the um, the imperfections that are so perfect. And that, you know, death for me is such a natural process in that we only have to look around us in nature to see it all going on all the time, all the time. Right. Um, so that's been my great teacher. I'm, you know, I did not come from really a family that thinks like that. And I'm, and I believe that my childhood and my teenage years growing up on that lake uh, just really instilled that in me. And I did have, you know, I did have a circle of adults that were, you know, they were radical. They were you know, always doing great things in the world, right? So I, so I did have that mentorship going on, you know? But yeah, just talking about death in the way of, you know, how is it you want to leave this earth? How do you want your friends or your community to, you know, bless you on your way and, and care for you, right? What does that look like, you know? And because we've, again, been so socialized and brainwashed in, in, you know, doctrination, 
ritual has always been left up to others and only certain others and usually only males, white males. And so ritual for me years and years ago was about reclaiming what is rightfully mine, you know? I mean, whether it was changing a diaper, that is, you know, hanging my clothes on the line. Those are my favorite, some of my favorite rituals, right? I mean, people have this idea that ritual is, again, you know, just like certain things that are done by other people. So when I include ritual, that's what I am hopeful for. You know, just this feeling that people feel so worthy to create their own rituals. And, and I, that is something I've done over many years. I've, I've done, you know, union ceremonies, death ceremonies, birth ceremonies. And, you know, meeting with the people that are asking that of me so that it includes their experience, right? Not something outside of their world, but, you know, creating a ritual that talks about them, that reflects them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, it was so interesting during your opening, sitting in the gallery and watching people's reactions to the work. It, it kind of, it ran this really wide gamut. One person felt like they had to step out to compose themselves for a while. Another person sat down and didn't want to talk to anyone and just watch the video over and over again for a while. I was wondering if you could speak to what your experience of people's reaction to your work is, because you're dealing with like taboo subjects like death and disability in a very gentle way. So it, it brings out this whole mix of emotions in the audience. That's really interesting. I'm so glad you're telling me this. Um, you know, I had the exhibition uh, in calendar five months ago. And, you know, yes, I mean, some people are just like a little bit in shock, you know, of it all. That I'm talking about that, that I've actually purchased my death silk, that I'm naked. Um, I mean, most of my community know that about me anyhow now because of you know, the amount of work I've done being naked now. I mean, not that I ever thought I'd do that, but I mean, you know, as you become crone, like I really feel like it is time to be radical and free, you know, cause people aren't getting it. They're not getting it when you're gentle. I mean, worked in sexual violence for 26 years of my life. And, you know, now I say, you know, you, you all asked us to be nice about our messages and nice hasn't worked. We're always like tiptoeing around what other organizations or schools or, you know, they would give us these rules, you know, you couldn't say blow job. You couldn't like, you know, you're talking about sexual violence and you can't say really what it is that's going on. Not that I haven't always been radical, but now I feel like it's just part of my responsibility, you know? And that raw, I mean, when you think of this sexual twistedness of people's minds in general and how they feel, you know, women especially, have you ever met a woman that loves her body? Like what, it's so rare, it's so rare because, you know, we've been dictated these, you know, we're always chasing the, chasing the cheese. We're the mice chasing the cheese. We're never gonna have nipples that color. We're never gonna have shapes that way. I mean, it's all, it's not real, right? So for me, that if it is shocking to people, well, maybe it'll be less next time they visit or see something like that, you know, like hopefully. And I got to say, I never really thought of the connotations of death, of like addressing death and disability in the same package, right? And I, and I get that it's a very, it's, 
it's a very sensitive issue, just again, because of the socialization. Um, I'm glad I didn't think of it as I did that, you know? I'm glad you feel like I did it gently. I appreciate you saying that. And so in the discussions that you had with attendees, like, was there any conversations? Were there anybody that wanted to talk about that? Um, there were a couple of people who talked to me, but mostly it was them talking to the other people that they came with and me just listening in. <laughs> and a lot of them ended up talking about their experiences with death of family members and people they were close to. And they talked a lot about, um, like they were all kind of surprised and found it interesting that you had thought ahead about what kind of ritual you wanted to do. I, I think most people don't really do that, right? And so a lot of people were speculating about what kind of ritual they would want to do. Wonderful. How wonderful is that? I mean, don't we plan ahead for most things? I mean, look at the planning that goes into Christmas, for God's sakes. Right? I mean, yeah, like when you think about that in itself, how people don't plan, or again, they leave it up to other people to do. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that, you know, letting me know that. I'm always so interested to hear how people respond to the work. And I think it's very relevant in the disability community that everyone will become disabled at some point in their life, right? We're all just a disabled person waiting to happen if we're not already a disabled person. And so the idea of like looking forward and seeing that as sort of an acceptable passage in life is is kind of radical. The one we don't have to pack for. <laughs> <laughs> like I think of all the trips I've taken and and packing, you know, it's just like this huge are you ever done, right? Until you actually get on the plane. But yeah, somebody said that to me one day, you know, it's the trip you don't have to pack for. Interesting. And, you know, thinking about my daughters, oh gosh, you know, they've always known these things. You know, they've always known where the silk was, what it was for. Um, but, you know, it's really, I, I have our youngest daughter we adopted from Ethiopia and, you know, she's had a few life and death situations over her life. And so death is like, you know, it's like right there for her. I mean, you know, being in a coma, like just everything, a drowning that she survived, like just, it's so there for her. And when she saw that, that film and those images, you know, she just had to say to me, like, I, 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 I can't imagine being without you. I can't, I, I don't think I could live without you. You've, you, it's like, you've kept me alive, you know? And, and seeing me with the silk. And she said, even though I knew the silk was always there and what it was for, seeing the image changed that for me. So I think about how that'll be for them. I think it'll be so beautiful, you know, cause it's not new, it's, it, they've, they've held the silk. They've seen me with, you know, in pure joy with the silk, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really, I so appreciate uh, that I kept going with this work, that I, that I just couldn't let it be, you know? And the four minute film, I think it's like just enough. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's not like a big conversation, just like laying down seeds, pondering. And where are you going from here? What's what's on the horizon in terms of your art practice? Well, you know, that just that 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 work just set me on such a path. Because when I came back, 
I realized that I needed a team, right? That, I, that it wasn't possible for me to make work now as a solo artist, that I needed a team. I needed a videographer, uh, a sound engineer, a photographer, a personal assistant, you know, separate from having a driver. Like it really, it really informed me. And so I set off and I wrote another grant to the Canada Council. And it was a biggie. It was, it was good. And it was, it ended up being a three, three year project, the book that I sent you to reconvene the shoreline. So that is the ending of the three year project, putting that exhibition catalog together. And, and so this work, you know, it, it's, it's like a, doing that first set this up for me, you know? And it was to talk about my love, my love of the great mother and how I've learned that throughout, you know, prehistory and looking at my lineage. I mean, I've been studying matrifocal uh, civilizations since my twenties. I've connected with women all around the world who, you know, are academics and healers and, you know, just the gamut, right, of who are doing this work. And it feels like reconciliation for me. You know, it feels like, you know, to the great mother, to all the folks, how we've been jarred and, and stripped of what, what we used to know, right? I mean, in this country, of course, we know exactly who has suffered greatly for that with First Nations, right? But, but I personally think everybody has, has that to go through. Um, and so again, being in the raw, being laying my body down in those images, I had a team of, of, of four that we went out on those two islands on Lake Nipissing for four days. We didn't talk, they all know me very well. I, but when I look at the work and what they captured, you know, that's pretty magical, right? That they got exactly what I was doing. Like they totally understood. And those islands I'd never been on before, you know? And they set out and would, they were little islands. They would walk the island and then they'd come back and their, their eyes would be this big. They'd be like, oh, you know, because they were going to find the places to look at the places they knew I'd want to be, right? I mean, you, you build such trust working in a team like that, you know, and that's why I really point out, you know, inter, interdependence, the interdependence of that, right? And as a disabled uh, person, I don't know, I think because I was, I was facilitating a lot of gatherings with women throughout the world for many years. And I was learning, you know, the old ways of nurturing, nurturing our sisters. And, and it just felt like my time. Like I had done that. I had done that for so long, you know, caring and nurturing for folks that when that happened to me, I was okay. I was okay to let people assist me and bathe me and, you know, feed me. Like, whereas what I find with most people, they're just, they're horrified. They're just horrified. You know, they don't want anybody, they don't want to ask for help. They, they can't even imagine somebody coming into their house, you know, and, and for me, those are all barriers to living my potential, you know? And yes, it takes a while because, you know, you're so ill. Um, and I still feel so ill, but I'm doing like so much better before than before, you know, and I found all these new ways to navigate so that I can live my potential. Mm -hmm. yes. As you all know, it's been, it's, it's a struggle. Like it ain't, it, it's not a, you know, and then I have lots of people now who say to me, oh, you know, like, you just did that so well. Like, look at you, you know, you've got your art. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm glad I made it look easy, but it wasn't. It's the same for everyone. 
you know, you just have to decide. Like you have to make some really clear decisions about how you want to live out your days, you know, but it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easier for me than anyone else. You know? Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned something earlier that really kind of piqued my interest when you were talking about the crone. So um, I've heard this from a lot of uh, older women artists who have um, so the idea of the uh, the maiden, the mother, and the crone, and about, you know, older women artists who are saying, you know what, I'm not going to be gentle anymore. I'm going to scream my, what I want, my artwork. And um, there's something so powerful about that. And I find that there's quite a few artists across Canada who are starting to relate to the crone and to really, and the power that exists within that position. Um and the wisdom. And so when you're talking about how stepping back from organizing these women gathering gatherings and 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 accepting help and and changing a path, for me, that's in my mind, I can see you growing from the mother to the crone and that that age where you might need more assistance, but you have so much wonderful power and wisdom to give. And that's what it that's what this 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 book feels like is you giving that wisdom back to um, mm to the folks and so it just it really resonated with me when you said when you mentioned the word crone because it's something that I've been hearing the last couple of years from other women artists um so I just wanted to mention that I oh my gosh I don't know how many years ago now but I I, I created rituals for crones for cr the crowning of the crone you know it, it is so powerful to be with it it always included um you know, younger women of all ages, and then the older women who were going to be crowned crone and by the younger women. You know, I mean, you're right. We've been taught to take up such little space, right? The value system of not listening to us, right? And women really being sold this idea that you know, we are just not worthy to be at the table. And, and of course that is just changing greatly now, you know? So yeah, I mean, being a crone, I mean, I'm, gosh, I feel like I've been a crone quite a while now, but you know, it's also this place where you just really don't have to worry about what people think anymore. Not that I ever did really, but, but I can see when women say that, you know, that that they they did spend many years in their life worried about what people think thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the great teachings that are being handed down in you know in all cultures that are there. Yeah, I used to do blood ceremonies too for menstruation. And oh, the cultural exchange. You know, I remember once when we had we had women from Trinidad that were circling with us and, and speaking about the rituals of their grandmothers, you know, where their faces was, were washed with the blood. I mean, it was seen as this most valuable medicine. Um, you know, there are stories in Hopi, uh, in, in Hopi teachings of making cornbread for the community right? Like it was never seen as this dirty thing to hide. It was a blessing. It was powerful. I mean, who else does that? Who else bleeds every month? Yeah. 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 I mean, that really just speaks to all you, to, to your work is when you're watching that video, when you're reading the book, you really feel like you can feel the sacredness, you know, that you're respecting the land, that you're respecting your body, that you're that connection between mm. the land and body. Um, it's just beautiful. And it's not that it's sacred to one group or religion. It's just kind of that natural sacredness that comes from connecting with the earth. Um, I think a lot of people respond to something that we're lacking in our community, that connection to the earth. Right. Like, do you know your mother? You know, 
oh my God, it's like people just don't even know their mother because who would want to hurt their mother? You know, which, you know, is what I thought originally too of, of, of violence against women. Like to me, that's it. It's like, you are so disconnected from your umbilical cord, right? And, and that of course we know comes from not seeing birth, not seeing where you came from, like the visual effect of having children participate in watching birth would change everything in a generation, I believe. You know? And I have, it has been my great intention for so many years of my life. And again, I don't know how that came to me, but I wanted to learn how to show and show respect and be honorable to all all faiths to all culture, you know? I've spent my life learning that, you know? I've had just wonderful communities all over the world that have shared that with me, how to do that, you know? And you're right, it's such a missing piece. You figure we're still having conversations. I mean, you know, this is why also I was a mediator. I realized I was a mediator in my work of 26 years in violence. And now I have no fucking patience to be a mediator. I'm not the one you call, right? Because pretty much I'm just gonna say like, where the fuck are you from? Like, how is it you still think like this? You know, like I just, I don't have it in me now. No patience that way because we've been having the same conversation for how long? You know, when settlers say, well, I didn't know about that going on. How could you have not known? Perry and I knew in our 20s, you know? We knew in our 20s this was all going on. And so I, I yeah, I'm not the person to be, <laughs> to be doing that work, <laughs> you know? It's time for someone younger to do that work. No, exactly. Yeah. And it's time for Crohn's to call it out. That's right. You know, because it's just been so much bullshit for so long. Yeah, yeah right? and that's where the power and the wisdom of the, of the Crohn's come from, because you guys have that power that you don't have the same restraints on community or from society that the younger generation, you know, have, because we're so tied into what people think and was so you know indoctrinated through school and through work and it's ongoing and we don't have that experience to break away so we need the crones to hey wake up guys this isn't right um so it's a very powerful position for you to take and one that uh, we need you might want to edit some of that out why <laughs> well it's up to you but i'm just no saying way. i mean the other thing we say too is you know we, it's a little bit of a joke i mean you know, it might be a little arrogant, but it's like, I got enough friends. I don't need any more friends. I don't need to be saying things to make friends. Right? Like you just get to that point where you're like, it's okay if they don't like what I say. You know, that whole thing of, you know, being, being among people and, you know, inappropriate things are being said and just like calling it right there with no problem at all, like, it's all good. It's what we need to do. I feel a deep sense of responsibility to everyone. Absolutely. And, and it yeah. comes through in your work. Thank you. So as I told you, you know, the submission process to all those galleries, I mean, the, it had its first inaugural uh, exhibition here at the Kennedy, which was wonderful so that I could document it and that some of that work made it into the catalog too, you know. The other really important piece for me in making both, both those works is that, you know, I show how an, a solo artist, now disabled, makes work with the team. I wanted that to be a real visual, you know, in the 16 minute film for To Reconvene Shoreline, you see all of that. You see those women helping me, getting in position, 
you know, and, and some of the places, as you can imagine, we were in, there was lots of safety concerns, but we're all Bush women. Um, but I completely, you know, trusted them, right? So yeah, and, and that it doesn't lessen the work, right? Because this is, you know, this is the thing I'm experiencing with galleries now is that, you know, there's this aesthetic, there's this aesthetic and it needs to change, right? We need to be able to have chairs in the gallery that are accessible, that my ass will fit into, that'll hold my back, that has, you know, rests that can, I can help lift myself up. We need to have wheelchairs present for the person that maybe doesn't have a wheelchair and doesn't have to ask for it, but knows it's right there, right? Like all of those things I really feel strongly need to change. Absolutely. I mean, disability is often viewed as an add-on, but when you think about it, it's part of nature. 25, you know, I, I think it's something, what, 20% of Canadians have disabilities. So it's not unknown. It's not unexpected. And um, so I'm with you. It's it's time for us to be expected places and yeah. and, and to have stuff ready for us when we come instead of constantly having to ask um I know I I don't like asking all the time sometimes I don't mind but other times I just think this is not okay there should be a chair here and a really comfy chair right? yeah yeah you know it's funny because we you know we we have said to places you know make sure you have chairs so throughout and a lot of the big art galleries um you know the fancy more contemporary places will have seats but like you said they're the really low kind of cool looking couches that doesn't help anyone a uh, bench are you kidding me <laughs> you know you want me to sit on a bench well guess what I'm not even gonna be able to stay here a couple minutes because that is sucking energy from the little energy I have absolutely right yeah there's so many minor changes that can be done you know just attitude shifting or adding a few extra seats and um, you know, we're seeing less pushback against it, but there's still, still resistance and, and, you know, people are happy to provide ASL or an image description, but they are not so happy to provide like a plain English version of a submission form, um, you know, and <laughs> so there's some accommodations people seem to be okay with and some that they aren't. So, you know, or the biggest one right now I'm finding is everything was online. Yeah. And now it's coming off. That's right. And that's something right. that, that we've been advocating for since the pandemic started, that as soon as stuff said it started going online, it has to stay there. We yeah, have to keep it up. It does. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as things are right now with so many people ill of, you know, everything, like not just COVID, but, you know, I, I'm not going in unmasked to, to places, right? Like, it's just... It's just about taking care of myself. Right. Right. So all of a sudden, not being able to attend something online. There you go. Right. The masses got their needs met meeting in person now, and we'll just forget about the rest. Right. Yeah. And that's why work such as yours is so important to remind us of our, the fragile, fragile nature of living. You know, we have to be there for one another. We have to support one another. We have to care for one another. Um, yeah. yeah, and it just, it really speaks strongly in your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And well, I'm mindful of the time because we're recording this and we'll need to upload it and have it manageable. Yeah. This is good. Um, I think that's is a good place good? to stop. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Kim. It was so great to hear more about your art practice and and you as a person and what you've you've contributed to the world. And I think it's pretty significant. Thank you. Well, if you hear of anything that I might not be aware of in Manitoba going on where I could submit, please, please Absolutely. let me know. Really, I'd be so appreciative of that. Absolutely. Yeah for both this work and the and the reconvene to shoreline absolutely okay, okay. So like sure. thank you it was so great speaking with you and we hope you have a wonderful day and can't wait to see what you do next sure will bye everyone <laughs>